Aloha and welcome. In this module, module six, we'll be talking about supporting IO devices. So this is part one, uh, CompTIA A plus core one, 210-1101. Uh, so the module objectives here are by the end, we're going to be able to describe the general approach technicians use to install and support IO devices. We're gonna install and configure several IO devices such as mice, keyboards, webcams, microphones, touch screens, and display devices. We're gonna install and configure adapter cards. We're gonna support the video subsystem, including selecting a monitor and video card and supporting dual monitors. And we'll also troubleshoot common problems with IO devices. So the basic principles for supporting IO devices, IO or storage devices may be internal or they may be external. Uh, these prin uh, basic principles apply to both of them. Uh, so every device is controlled by software. The best guide for installation and support of a uh, device is the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, some devices need application software to use uh, with the device. Uh, device is no faster than the port or slot it is designed to use. Uh, you should use an administrator account uh, in Windows. Uh, problems are sometimes solved by updating drivers or firmware and install only, install only one device at a time. So wired and wireless connection standards used by peripheral devices. Uh, we're not gonna go into it here. You've got table 6.1 for data transmission speeds uh, for all the different types. Uh, you'll probably need to know that for the A plus exam. Um, yeah, it's uh, also when deciding which connection standard to use for a new device, the speed of the transmission standard is often a tiebreaker. Uh, that goes without saying, but uh, go over table 6.1 for the uh, different speeds that you're gonna need to know. Uh, then the connectors and ports used by peripheral, uh, peripheral devices, uh, USB connections and ports. You can have as many as 127 USB devices uh, that can be daisy chained together. And for the love of God, do not do that. Um, I've never ever seen anything like that. Uh, that would be quite insane, but uh, you can technically do that. Um, USB uses serial transmissions and devices are hot swappable. That means that you can plug them in and unplug them without having to reboot your computer. Um, a USB cable has four wires. Two of them are for power and two of them are for communications. Uh, when it comes to the different USB uh, standards, we have USB 4, we have Super Speed Plus, Super Speed, High Speed, and original USB logos that appear on the uh, different products that are certified by the USB forum. And if you think that's confusing, it is. So video connectors and ports, uh, video ports are provided by a video card or the motherboard. Um, used to be that uh, before you would have everything integrated on a motherboard, you'd be buying separate uh, cards for everything. Now you've got a lot of that that's already integrated into the motherboard. There's not a whole lot to buy outside of that. Um, generally, these aren't the types of computers we're gonna be using uh, for uh, gaming systems. We usually want something that's kind of bare bones. We don't need a lot of functionality on there. Maybe the uh, network, but that's about it. The rest we kind of want to have, uh, you know, especially at the video card, we want to be able to control that. Um, so video cards are sometimes called uh, graphic adapters, graphic cards, display cards, display adapters. Um, most motherboards sold today have one or more onboard video ports. Uh, the types of video ports can include VGA, DVI, display port, and HDMI connectors. Uh, so here you have in the BIOS, BIOS or the UEFI setup, uh, you can go ahead and enable or disable those ports. So if you enable it or disable it here, remember that it'll also be, so if you disable something here, you're not gonna have access to it in the operating system. Additional connectors and ports, uh, we've got Thunderbolt. It's a multi-purpose connector uh, used for high-end displays, external storage devices, and to charge power for smartphones and laptops. You've got the eSATA port that we've talked about previously. Those are using for uh, connecting, uh, used for connecting external storage devices to a computer. You've got the lightning connector, which is uh, uh, specific to um, Apple. And I just happen to have one right here uh, in front of me. It goes USB to a lightning connector. Um, we have the old, old, old RS-232 connectors uh, that have been primarily replaced by USB. I don't think you'll see those around anywhere. I had one years and years ago, but uh, I haven't seen those forever. Uh, this here is an eSATA uh, connection that's used to connect external storage devices to a computer. So you can see that uh, if you take a look at the uh, device, you can see the slotting for uh, SATA on there. Uh, 
then we're going to go ahead and continue on. Uh, simple input devices, mouse and keyboard can be controlled by the BIOS U UEFI or have embedded drivers built into the OS. Uh, general procedures to install any peripheral device. First, read the manufacturer's directions. They will have uh, anything uh, that may be peculiar to their devices. Make sure the drivers are written for the OS you are using. Uh, make sure the motherboard port you're using is enabled. If it's not, again, you're not going to have access to that in Windows. Uh, you want to install drivers or plug in the device. Uh, you want to install the application software to use the device. This is something that's uh, not as necessary for things like mice and keyboard. But if you have something special, like I use uh, Logitech, uh, special uh, MX, can't see it, uh, MX keyboard. Uh, these, I do want to have the special functionality thrown in there, as well as the mouse too. I've got a MX mouse, so I do uh, have the application software installed. But in general, if you've just got a, a standard from the manufacturer wired or wireless uh, keyboard, you're not gonna need a whole lot of extra uh, functionality there with the application software. Um, so the next thing is plug a mouse or keyboard into a USB port and Windows should automatically recognize it and install generic drivers. So older PS2 uh, ports are not hot pluggable, so you must restart Windows after plugging into this type of port. Again, if you're using a system with PS2 ports, you're using a PS2 keyboard. Wow, I can't imagine the environment you're working in. Uh, I own a couple of these still, but uh, these are just for museum real relic kind of uh, purposes. Uh, I use it because I have an old, old system that needs to use a three and a half inch and a five and a quarter inch floppy. Ask me someday what those things are. Um, but that's the only reason why I have anything PS2 remaining. Uh, for keyboards with special features, install the drivers that came with the keyboard. Like I said, my MX keyboard here, I do have extended drivers to take uh, or extended uh, software to take uh, to make use of a lot of the different functionality on here, uh, special programming and things like that. Um, so use the device manager to in uninstall, disable, and enable most in, uh, devices. Uh, USB devices are managed through the apps and features window. Um, replace the keyboard and touchpad in a laptop. Why not? Um, power down the laptop and remove the AC adapter and battery pack so you don't get shocked. Uh, remove the screws on the bottom of the laptop. Remove the lid on the bottom of the laptop to expose the keyboard ribbon cable. Then you're going to turn the laptop over and open the lid. You're going to use a spudger, which is uh, like a little spatula almost that you use in the uh, kitchen to pry the keyboard bezel away from the case. You're going to lift the keyboard bezel from the case. Then you're going to replace the keyboard following the steps in reverse order. So this is what a spudger looks like. It looks like a little... Uh, frosting uh, tool that you use in the kitchen. Uh, so you use that to get in between the two and to pry them open without hurting it. So webcams, a webcam or web camera is embedded in most laptops and can also be installed as a peripheral device using a USB port or some other port. If you ever do have a webcam that's internal that goes bad, you can use a, an external USB to uh, give yourself that functionality back. First, install the software and then plug in the webcam to a USB port. A webcam comes with a built-in microphone usually. You can also use the microphone port on the computer if you prefer. Uh, most software for using a webcam and microphone allows you to select these input devices. A graphics table or a graphics tablet is sometimes called a digitizing tablet or digitizer, which is used to hand draw. It is likely to connect using a USB port and comes with a stylus like a pencil that works like a, you know, works like a pencil on the tablet and controls the pointer on the screen. So you're gonna install the graphics tablet the same way you do other USB devices, and you're gonna install any additional software that might be bundled with that device. So now we're gonna do a quick knowledge check. Uh, your manager bought a new printer with a USB 3.0 port and it came with a USB 3.0 cable. Your manager asks if uh, it will work uh, if they connect it to the printer's USB cable. Uh, if they plug that into a USB 2 port on the computer, what is your answer? It's going to be A, no, the printer can only use a, a USB 3.0 port. That's not it because these are backwards compatible. Yes, it will work, but at the USB 2.0 speed, I believe that is correct. Um, then three, yes, it'll work at the uh, USB 3.0 speed. This is not correct. Uh, you're always going to be limited by the slower of the two. Um, and yes, it will work, but at the USB 1.1 speed, why in the love of God would it do that if you had USB 3 and USB 2? So this is not correct either. And yes, it was B, 
Uh, the connection can only function at the lowest speed in the connection. So continuing on, installing and configuring adapter cards. When preparing to install an adapter card, do the following. Verify that the card fits into the empty expansion slot. Verify that the device drivers for the OS are available. Back up important data that is not already backed up and know your starting point. It's kind of scary that it says back up important data at this point because if you're installing a, a card and it messes up the system bad enough that you can't even access the hard drive, things have gone very wrong, my friend. So uh, continuing on general directions to install an adapter card, read the documentation for the card. If replacing an onboard port, disable the port in the BIOS uh, UEFI setup. Uh, where an uh, electrostatic uh, uh, strap uh, shut down the computer, unplug the power cords and drain the power out. Uh, so the general directions to install an adapter card, locate the slot uh, that you plan to use and remove the face plate cover from, uh, from the slot, insert the card into the slot and anchor the card to the top of the slot with the screws, connect any power uh, cords or data cables that need to be uh, put on it especially video cards if you need to put an extra uh, power cord on there. Replace the case cover, plug in any essential peripherals. Start the system. Windows should detect a new hardware device and attempt to automatically install the drivers. If a CD came with the device, insert and run the setup program. If you don't know what a CD is, not many people these, do, uh, these days do. CD is one of those round disc looking things that people don't use anymore because they just directly download the software from the site or install it using a USB uh, flash drive. Um, and you may also have to restart the system after doing this. Here is uh, a picture of a um, PCIe power uh, connector that goes onto a card that's been installed. So sound cards and onboard sound. A sound card or an onboard uh, sound uh, can uh, play and record sound and save it in a file. Uh, that's a very rudimentary explanation. Uh, Color-coded speaker ports are for speakers and subwoofers. Uh, ports may also be available to connect to external sound equipment, such as CD or DVD players. Again, um, if you need to know what a CD or DVD player is, uh, we have museums that you can go to and see these kinds of things. Capture cards. This is something uh, that I actually use in various forms. A capture card is a peripheral device or an expansion card that's used to record and stream content from an external device, such as a gaming console or a webcam. I have uh, one that allows me to pull in uh, video for uh, uh, DSLRs, so I can have that piped in as uh, another uh, window. And it goes from uh, that into a USB port. Uh, so those are very convenient. Um, I think I've got an Elgato uh, camera, connect, uh, connect, camera link, I think it's called. Um, some capture cards use a PCIe port on the motherboard. Uh, another type of capture card is a peripheral device that connects to the computer using a USB, USB-C, or a Thunderbolt, uh, Thunderbolt port, like the one I just mentioned, the Elgato. Um, some capture cards also offer ports for input uh, from a microphone and output to a headset. After installing a capture card, you can download and use a proprietary software that comes with a card, or you can use third-party software. There's a lot of... Uh, free uh, third-party software out there that can make use of a lot of these things. So replacing expansion cards in a laptop. Uh, newer laptops are uh, likely to use the mini PCI Express slots, the mini PCIe's. Uh, they've got 52 pins on the edge connector. Uh, for many laptops, remove the cover on the bottom of the laptop to expose the expansion cards. Then for uh, cards that have an antenna on it, be sure to remove the black and gray antenna wires before replacing the card, else you're going to be ruining it. So um, use the device manager to ensure that the device is, proper, uh, is working properly after you install it. And this is an image of one of those uh, mini PCI Express cards. You've got to remove that screw on it first before you take it off. And you'll notice here that you've got the, um, the antenna that goes to the, uh, the chassis there. So you're going to have to undo that too. You're going to have to disconnect that before you get it out. Then after you've uh, gotten the screw out, it's going to, you're going to lift it up and you're just going to pull it out of the slot. So supporting the video subsystem, a monitor is the primary output device of a computer. I think anybody that's ever used a computer understands that. I uh, don't really think this is something we need to say. Two necessary components for video output are the monitor and the video card, also called the video adapter or a graphics card, as we talked about earlier, uh, or a video port on the motherboard. 
So types of monitors include the following. We've got LCD, the liquid crystal display monitor, also called a flat panel monitor, uh, which was first used in the laptops. Uh, at the center of uh, layer, uh, at the center of layers is liquid crystal material. The layers are sandwiched between two grids of electrodes that form columns and rows, and each intersection of row and column forms what we call a pixel. So we're going to have a good graphic of that coming up next. We also have OLED, which is organic light emitting diodes, and that's the type of monitor that uses a thin LED light emitting diode layer or a film between two grids of electrodes and does not use backlighting. Um, that's an advantage. And uh, then you have uh, digital projectors, and those uh, shine lights, uh, uh, those shine light basically that projects a transparent image onto a large screen. So you can use it on a screen, a wall, something like that. And here is a very complex uh, example of uh, the layers of an LCD panel. And if you ever have to repair one of these things, good luck. It's uh, a, not a lot of fun. I had to work on an HP laptop once that had a backlighting source that was uh, damaged and I ended up giving up on it. It was so bad, but uh, you've got the backlighting, you've got the polarizer, the glass, the column electrodes, color layer, liquid crystal layer, the row electrodes, the glass, the polarizer. Uh, there's just a lot to it. And you can see over here in the graphic that a pixel is formed by the intersection of the row and the column electrodes. So changing monitor settings, uh, settings that apply to the monitor can be managed by using the monitor buttons function keys on a keyboard and Windows utilities. Using the monitor buttons, you can do the following, adjust the horizontal and vertical position of the screen, change the brightness and uh, contrast settings. There's often like a degaussing uh, button on there. Uh, it just depends on the, uh, the manufacturer and the make of your, uh, your monitor as to what you have access to there, but there's a lot of controls that you can use. Um, on laptops, function keys are usually used instead of buttons. And Windows utilities can also be used to change your monitor settings as well. So when you're troubleshooting IO devices, when troubleshooting peripheral devices, always try the least invasive and least expensive solution first. Uh, this section is gonna cover how to handle some of the errors and problems you might uh, encounter. And first we've got the simplest of everything, NumLock indicator light. So when users complain that they can't sign into Windows, even when entering the correct password, ask them to make sure the NumLock key is set correctly. So laptops use this key or, uh, to toggle between the keys interpreted as letters and numbers. Uh, most laptops have an unlock uh, indicator light near the keyboard. This reminds me of a couple of jokes about users that are probably not that nice, but we also call that a PEBCAC error. You spell out PEBCAC, it means problem exists between keyboard and chair. There's also the ID10T uh, error. And if you write that out, you'll understand what that means. Uh, so the device manager is a handy dandy utility that uh, I've used forever. The device manager is usually a good uh, place to start uh, troubleshooting hardware that's not working properly. Uh, to see a device's property, uh, uh, properties, you can look in the dialog box. Uh, you right click the device, you click on properties. Uh, you can update your drivers through there. You can click on the upgrade, update driver on the general tab or driver tab. If a driver uh, update uh, creates the problem, you can roll them back as well. Uh, try to uninstall the device and reinstall it by clicking uninstall on the driver tab. Uh, you can also locate and download the latest drivers from the manufacturer and install them directly, or you can do it from the tabs here. And this is uh, what the device manager looks like. Those little, or, uh, little uh, yellow exclamation marks there, that means something is not right. And if you go and look in general, it'll say under device status, you can get a good idea of what's going on. There are no compatible drivers for this device. And you may see some of this stuff happen if you take an old device that worked uh, pre-Windows 10 or pre-Windows you know, whatever, and now in your new Windows version, they don't have uh, device drivers that support it. You can come across that on occasion. Audio issues. When you're having audio issues, try the following. Make sure the volume is turned up. That's a no-brainer. That's uh, step one. Then you check all the audio cables, jacks, speakers, and headphone connections. Again, more common sense. And the last thing is update the audio drivers. It could be that you have bad drivers installed. Uh, when you're troubleshooting videos, monitors, and projectors for monitor and video problems, try doing the easy things first, such as checking the cable connections and checking contrast brightness adjustments. I've actually seen it where people had their contrast turned down so, or, or their brightness turned down so low they couldn't see the screen. Once they adjusted that, they were able to see their screen just like normal. 
Uh, you have to go all the way down to have that problem though. So that's a rare thing, but I've seen it actually happen. Um, try the following steps when dealing with a blurry screen. Clean the screen with an electronic safe uh, cleaning wipe or cloth. Um, you can also set your monitor resolution to its native or recommended resolution, and you should check your cable connections as well. Uh, the problems with video card installations, when you first uh, power up the system, you hear a whining sound. In that kind of case, uh, look and see if your, uh, your card's getting enough power. You may not have a power supply that's adequate. We talked about that in the power supply section, making sure that you've got enough wattage uh, to handle all your devices inside. Um, when you first uh, start the system, you see nothing but a black screen. Well, for that, most likely caused by the onboard video port not being disabled in BIOS UEFI. UEFI. So go in there, disable your onboard video so it's going to be using your, uh, your uh, card that you put in there. So when you first start up the system, you hear a series of beeps. That could be that UA, uh, UEFI BIOS cannot detect the video card at all. So try reseating it, unseat it, then plug it back in, see if that helps. And uh, go check out your, uh, you know, it, hopefully it won't beep or anything. But if not, then, uh, yeah, you need to move on to the next step. Um, error messages about the video appear when Windows starts. So it could be that you've got a conflict with the onboard video port. So try disabling that and see if that helps. So uh, in a situation where your monitor indicator light is not on and you've got no image on the screen, ask these questions and try these things. And I'm serious. Is the monitor power cable plugged in? So is it plugged in? Uh, is it turned on uh, in, the, in that order? Uh, and th th those are serious uh, PEBCAC errors. Uh, is the monitor cable plugged into the video port at the back of the PC? And the last thing is try a different monitor and a different monitor cable. And if you find out like by trying a different monitor with the same cabling, uh, then that means your monitor is probably the problem. If uh, you try it and it works, then you know obviously uh, you know you've got another issue there. So uh, or wait, if you're if you try a different monitor with the same cabling, your uh, monitor and it works, your monitor's you know okay. If that monitor doesn't work, it could be your cabling. So yeah, you're going to have to go through step by step and eliminate what it could be there. Uh, so in a case where your monitor indicator light is on and you've got no image on the screen, so uh, the following are the what you should try. Make sure the video cable is securely connected. Confirm that the video input source is set to the correct connector. Ensure that the monitor is set to the correct voltage. I've never actually had to do that before, but uh, that could possibly be it, 110 versus 220. I really don't think you're going to find many cases where that is necessary. Uh, there might be a conflict with the video card and the onboard video port. Uh, verify that the video cable connection in, uh, uh, ver verified inside the case. <clears throat> uh, check the contrast adjustment or the br uh, brightness or backlight adjustment, as I mentioned earlier. That could, in extreme cases, be the problem. And then test a monitor that you know is good on the computer that you suspect is bad. So if you try another monitor on there and it works, then you know that uh, yeah, your monitor is an issue. So uh, in a situation where your screen goes blank for 30 seconds or one minute after the keyboard is left untouched, obviously we're talking about uh, power uh, energy saver mode stuff here. So if the keyboard is a green motherboard and uh, is being used with an energy saver monitor, it can be configured to go into standby or sleep mode after a period of inactivity. So this feature can uh, help prevent burn in. Burn is when you have pretty much the same image on your screen all the time and it starts to burn into the LCD itself. To prevent that, you've got, uh, in the old days, we used a lot of screen savers, things like that. Now we just go into a sleep mode where we darken out the screen. So um, use the power options applet in control panel to configure the sleep settings on a computer. You can set it for all different types of uh, situations when you're on battery power or not on battery power uh, in the case of a laptop and uh, there's other options in there as well. Um, if you've got a poor display, solve these problems by using controls on the monitor and window settings. LCD monitor controls are usually located on front of the monitor. Window, uh, Windows display settings can be used to adjust the font size, the screen resolution, brightness, color, and clear type text. Uh, you can update the video drivers. Um, you might have dead pixels. Dead pixels are pixels that aren't working. They come up as little black spots in the image. Uh, you can have dim image, so laptops uh, dim the LCD uh, screen when the computer is running on battery 
Also, if you've got backlight uh, issues going on, that happens. Uh, poor display uh, might be caused by inadequate video RAM as well. Um, in, this, in the case that you can't connect to external monitor or projector, make sure the monitor or projector is getting power. That's a given. Check the connection at both ends of the video cable. This is sounding like a lot of the other things we've done. The, the troubleshooting is very similar for these as well. Um, is the monitor or projector turned on? That's, a, that's also important. Uh, again, that's a PEBCAC error. Use the function keys on a laptop to toggle between the laptop display and the external uh, monitor projector to see if uh, the laptop is working okay. And then you know, try getting the external monitor projector to work as well. Uh, try using a different video cable. Sometimes you might have a bad cable or just one that doesn't work with that particular uh, uh, projector. Um, another thing you can do is try using a different uh, video connection. Uh, if the projector shuts off unexpectedly, it might have entered sleep mode due to an inactivity. That happens a lot. Uh, you can set your uh, sleep mode a little bit differently, have it go off after, you know, or you, know, you can even set it to not go off at all. So uh, that could help. So video systems in a laptop. If the LCD panel shows a black screen, but the power light is on, try the following. First, look for an LCD cutoff switch or button on the laptop. You can uh, try to use the video port on the laptop to connect to an external monitor, see if that works. Uh, if the external monitor does work, then the problem is with the LCD uh, panel assembly, and you're gonna need to probably replace the inverter or the LCD panel itself. So if you've got in your laptop flickering, dim, or otherwise poor video, uh, some tips to solve the problems with bad video include the following, verify that Windows display settings, make sure that your resolution and everything is okay, um, your refresh rates, things like that. Uh, adjust the brightness, update your video drivers for it. If the cursor drifts on the screen when the mouse or uh, touchpad isn't being used, try using a different port on the computer or replacing the batteries in the mouse uh, because that can have it slowly, slowly, slowly moving. And uh, that can, yeah, cause some uh, weirdness. So a flickering screen can be caused by bad video drivers as well, a low refresh rate or a bad inverter or loose connections inside the laptop as well. So you can go about uh, checking into each of those in turn, but start with the easiest first and then move to the more difficult. So now we're gonna have our, uh, our last knowledge check here. Uh, so our knowledge check, you plug a new scanner into a USB port on your Windows system. When you first turn on the scanner, what should you expect to see? So a couple key things here, USB. What do we know about USB? They're hot swappable. They don't require a restart, right? So let's look. A message is displayed by the scanner software telling you to reboot your system. As I just mentioned, hot swap bolt don't have to reboot. So that's probably not the correct answer. Second one is Windows device setup uh, launches to install drivers. That sounds like a winner to me. C, your system automatically reboots. That shouldn't happen. Uh, and D, an error message from the USB controller is displayed. Hopefully this doesn't happen. I would say our answer here should be B in a perfect world. And indeed, B is our answer. Uh, Windows device setup launches to install drivers. Windows tries to install the device using embedded drivers. So in summary, now the lesson is ended, you should be able to describe the general approach technicians use to install and support IO devices. You should be able to install and configure several IO devices such as mice, keyboards, webcams, microphones, touchscreens, and display devices. Uh, you should be able to install and configure adapter cards. Uh, you should be able to support the video subsystem, including selecting a monitor and video card and supporting dual monitors. And you should be able to troubleshoot common problems with IO devices. So that concludes our lesson here. Again, uh, I uh, skipped some of the uh, information early on in the beginning. Uh, if you have any questions about any of this material, feel free to contact me, send me an email, and I'd be happy to go over it with you. Uh, and uh, that being said, I will see you in our next lesson. Have a great day.